Hello? Hello? Welcome. Welcome, everyone. We at Oregon Public Broadcasting are so happy to have you here. Wanted to thank the Mission Theater for having us today. I also wanted to thank the Nature Program producers at WNET for sharing with us this excellent film. And um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Cassandra Profita, and <laughs> I am a uh, journalist blogger at OPB. Um, I'm a new hybrid kind of journalist. Um, and I have a baby blog called Ecotrope. It's about eight months old, and you all have bookmarks on your table to help you find the site. And um, we have a discussion. The discussion we're starting today will continue on Ecotrope, so feel free to come and feed the blog with comments. It loves attention. Um, we have, um, the, my blog is part of, hold on, part of a larger project at OPB. We're going to be launching a, um, a Northwest Nature Center. It's kind of a, um, a compilation of journalists around the Northwest and adding seven reporters on environmental issues. They're going to be stationed around the Northwest. We have a few people from this project here tonight that I wanted to just let you know about. We have David Steves, who is the editor of our Northwest Journalism Center. Uh, we have Tony Taboro Roberts, who is our Community Engagement Coordinator. And um, we have Aaron Coons, who is our reporter in Boise, and he works at Idaho Public Television. You'll see him. He's going to be walking around and, I think, videotaping all of this excitement. Um, and uh, with that, I wanted to also thank our filmmaker, Jim Norton, for coming and... <laughs> I'm going to let him introduce the film. Um, first, I just want to check and see um, how many people here are OPB members. Woo! Yay! Okay! So if you are, um, you probably got something like this in the mail today. Um, introducing our Salmon Running the Gauntlet um, showing, which is going to be on TV on Sunday. Um, and we are so happy to have our members here. So with that, um, Jim, why don't you come on up and tell us about your film. Okay, thanks. First order of business, since this is a social occasion, is if you're sitting next to somebody and they look kind of tense and they're shifty in their seats and they're maybe nervously texting somebody with a dot gov or, a, or like a dot quasi gov or a dot org uh, email address, it's probably one of the unfortunate people who represents an organization with a big stake in a court case that the public is expecting a verdict on in the imminent future. And so I want you to reach over and give them a pat on the hand or buy them a whiskey, because it's okay. This is not that kind of project. Sorry, but when there's an elephant in the room, you might as well pet it. Um, I'll say right from the outset on the record that in the course of making this film, its long, painstaking course, I did not meet anybody in any context who was doing anything other than their best for salmon in that context. Uh, where we require, well, where the situation requires of us a certain measure of courage is to be able to look at the context of all those contexts put together. And that is what this project is about. It's a nature film about salmon, what they need, why they are so extraordinarily important to us, why they have such an enduring hold on our culture, and how the intersection of our life history with theirs is supportive of, expressive of their extraordinary resilience and abundance, and where maybe certain assumptions have led us astray. So we'll get back to that in just a second. But from the outset, uh, settle in, it's going to be all right. Um, I think I'll use up 
my very brief time in an introduction to take advantage of the moment and give a huge shout out for Oregon Public Broadcasting and public media in general. Um, sorry, I keep looking up here because I've never seen this film on anything bigger than my laptop, so I'm kind of mesmerized. Uh, but you may have heard that um, public media is having its um, absurdly proportionately small budgets uh, given a fair degree of scrutiny, and it is impossible to overstate the importance of having institutions like OPB in our communities with people down on the ground exploring the relationship between people and place, especially so at a time when so much of our national, political, and economic narrative has so little to do with the reality of day-to-day -day life here and what we hope for going forward. And they are going to need our support. That is very distinct from uh, the dreaded solicitation for donations, uh, the distinction being that a donation is something that you give with the promise you'll never see it again, and the investment that we need to make in institutions like OPB are very much about getting that tangible return of an evolving understanding of the world that we live in. So keep them in mind, uh, they matter. Um, this project specifically to transition into what this is all about would never ever have been made in any other forum other than public media. And to give you some appreciation of that, I'll walk you through what it's like for me to go present this story to a non-public media uh, television producer of a nationally broadcast nature series. So I walk in and say, hey, I have got the nature story of our time. This thing is, this is really rich. And they say, all right, at this point, you'd be really uh, well served to have a lot of footage of animals with lots of fur, preferably trailing a litter or a bunch of cubs of some form. Um, maybe animals with great big eyes, kind of disproportionate to the size of their heads. So when you say something like salmon, this is about salmon, you're going to get a look like you just dropped a rotten one in their lap. And you're still in the game to the extent they're thinking of like glaciers and wolves and bears and all kinds of things. But when you say, this is a story about endangered Columbia River salmon, our tangled relationship to them, the hundred year old set of assumptions on which that relationship is based, and uh, the extraordinarily complex, creative, uh, and controversial effort that has become our one of the most uh, extensive natural resource recovery efforts in human history. And they say, okay, let me put this back to you. You have a near tragic tale of primary interest to a small pocket of the country that couldn't be further from most of our major uh, population centers about a character um, that has fish, uh, has scales and slime, and is really difficult to find in its natural habitat because it lives in a kind of virtual world uh, that bears scant resemblance to what we set out to save. And I say, well, you could put it like that. <laughs> and they say, well, how would you put it if you had about 20 more seconds to tell this story and one more chance before Baby Seal 911 comes in here and gives me their pitch? And if it weren't for public media, I'd have to totally sell out and say, all right, it's Finding Nemo meets the Matrix, and it's perfect for Sunday nights and families because there's almost no wild sex anywhere in the watershed. <laughs> but I did not have to do that. So, <laughs> the truth, of course, is that the story of Columbia is much bigger than that. Uh, there is a lot of focus right now on a judge and his imminent decision and its implications for the Colombian snake hydropower system. There will be a lot of media attention on the implications of four dams on the Lower Snake River to the extent that that's biologically the most efficient restoration mechanism and certainly the most culturally dr dramatic restoration mechanism, maybe that's appropriate. But I just ask you to consider that this story is way bigger than Judge Redden. It always has been and it will be after his verdict becomes public and it will require us uh, to tell it. And there is nothing prescriptive that is going to come out of a courtroom that is going to settle this issue. 
will relieve of us of the responsibility of continuing to work it out. And I don't think that we can do that effectively unless we have a really good understanding of where we came from, the assumptions on which that was based, and how that affects our evolving understanding of our life in the watershed with salmon. And that's what this story is about. And uh, after I get off and 50 minutes later, there's gonna be a panel of people up here that's a great place to start asking questions about how we might kind of lay aside our legacy expectations and start to constitute that world we wanna live in 50 years from now in the Columbia watershed. So uh, thanks a lot for being here. A lot of people had a lot of faith in my faith that this mattered to you and deserve to be told on a national scale. I uh, appreciate it, we all do. And our, our time is a little short tonight, so we can't discuss all of the many issues that this film brings up. But um, I do want to ask each of the panelists a couple questions and then open it up and hopefully get a couple questions in from, from you guys. Um, and I know we have some people here from Bonneville Power and uh, the Corps of Engineers, and so I would give them the first right of refusal on uh, commenting on our discussion. Um, oh, here's Dan. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so so Jim Norton, I wanted to start with you and just let you talk a little bit about we you know we saw some some highs and some lows I felt in the film, um, and I wanted to see what what was your inspiration for making the film? What message were you hoping people would walk away with? Uh, the inspiration for making the film is that I've worked as a river guide for the last 17 years. I'm not, or I wouldn't characterize myself as a filmmaker, although I'm certainly interested in story. Uh, but I, one of the first places I started working, where I still work, is up in the upper vasculature of the Columbia system, uh, in the Salmon River system, and on the Selway, in the Frank Church Wilderness and the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness. And for the first few years that I worked there, I was really young and very well insulated from the sometimes inconvenient burden of conflicting education or experience, and I thought everything was pretty well perfect. And uh, Jerry Myers, who was my outfitter at the time, was really instrumental in talking to all of us who worked for him about the fact that something wasn't entirely whole and what that was. And to be honest, it was a little frustrating at the time. It's like, you know, when somebody kind of messes with something that for you is a form of ideal. It was a little annoying, especially since he didn't pay us much. And uh, so all of us who worked for Jerry and who still work together became really interested in the story of Salmon, not from an advocacy perspective, but from the perspective of our life living and working along these systems. And obviously in that context, you live in a really rich iconography of salmon. You work on the Salmon River system. We're based out of the town of Salmon. You drink sockeye beer. Uh, you go to Redfish Lake and run Redside Rapid. And you know, I think we've all wrestled a little bit with the paradox of kind of adopting and being really connected to this rich natural and cultural heritage, but living within the absence of the heritage itself. I mean, the heritage that derived from true abundance. And so I got interested in it. And I would say, well, down the line, this is a product of uh, my interest in that story. And as I started poking around, I found that a lot of the narrative about who was good, who was bad, was less important as that really interesting idea that this is less about the now familiar portfolio of insults uh, to these systems, how we destroy, and, and very much about how we approached saving. And that a lot of the conflict we're now wrestling with about salmon is I think an unfortunate consequence of not spending enough time talking about how that basic set of assumptions that's now a century old is, is influencing the conversation and might need to be revised going forward because I think there's a lot of middle ground in readdressing that. Thank you. Um, 
Dan Bottom, I wanted to ask you about the sort of killer quote from um, David Duncan. And he says, you know, we're trying to replace Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart with Yanni, Yanni, and Yanni. Um, and you have a pretty good grasp of sort of hatchery versus wild science. Um, do, you, do you see it that way? Well, I, <clears throat> I don't have quite his gift for, uh, for capsulizing it that way, but I would say that uh, the, the, the whole history of, of, of hatchery programs was built under a whole different set of assumptions and ideas than what that what we're now operating on when we're trying to recover salmon. Um, hatcheries are a tool, and at the time, that tool was meant to maximize abundance, um, as the film I think that uh, talks about in, in, uh, very well. It was largely built under the idea that we could remove constraints. We would take away the things that are a problem for salmon uh, by controlling the environment. And, and the things that don't make sense when you look at this very comprehensively, as Jim has done here, that when we look at it, we have kind of a gut reaction that this fix led to this fix led to this fix. Individually, those things made sense. You know, people, well-intentioned people did those things not because they're trying to cause a problem, but because in isolation, any one of those things can make sense. They begin to not make sense when you when you put them all together. And in the context of the hatcheries, the question was removing constraints, husbanding the fish, and what can be wrong with that. In an ecological sense, the fish had evolved to deal with everything but a controlled environment. They had developed strategies to allow them to get by incredible uncertainty. And the way they did that was they diversified their portfolios just as you do for the stock market. They spawn in lots of different places. They spread their risk widely throughout the basin. They spread it widely through time. And the hatchery program, whether you call it Yanni, Yanni, and Yanni, the hatchery program looked for the optimum condition that would always be good for salmon. And that's fine if, if they happen to hit the ocean at just the right time and the right size, if, they, if the predators were there at just the right time, if the water conditions were just right when they were released. But we can't predict those things. Those things are all over the board. And, um, and in the effort to try to control and make salmon, <laughs> make nature safe for salmon, uh, we basically eroded uh, the underlying productivity that allows them to be so resilient. And so that's a theme that I think comes out very, very strong throughout this. So hatcheries basically reallocated production in time and space into very narrow windows when, as Jim Martin says in the film, they were, they were running through the system 12 months of the year, and that was one of the things that provide them with resilience. Um, I wanted to follow that with um, the same similar question to, to Charles Hudson. Um, we had a conversation earlier, and I'm wondering what, what the tribes feel about um, hatchery production and, and its role in salmon recovery. Sure. Well, I'm the guy who ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, this is maybe to Jim. Uh, I think Danielle Searcy was wonderful in her brief appearance. Um, I do, I wish that there was, um, Dave, and David James Duncan is a great guy, but I do wish there was a, uh, somebody who would have spoken directly to the tribal right, you know, from maybe perhaps tribal government or, a, or an elder, or Leonard Dave, who was one of the, the scaffold fishermen on the, Cl the Klickitat River, who is benefiting, you know, exercising his right in a usual and a custom place in a traditional way with the benefit of a Klickitat hatchery program. It's not a perfect world, but it is a, um, a means to an end. Uh, the, as well, um, I think hatchery fish, uh, fish can lose resilience. They can rebuild resilience. Uh, the, maybe borrowing a little bit from the story, the Carson fish hatchery here, the, uh, the farmer rancher hearing the sound of spawning fish, um, that's happening in the Umatilla, in the Walla Walla, where 
no fish existed for the last 70 and 100 years, and Carson fish have been outplanted in the uh, in both of those systems, and now people are fishing, farmers and ranchers are hearing the sound of spawning fish. So we view hatcheries uh, as a tool, uh, and believe me, tribal people have heard that promise, uh, and we, we hear it every month at our commission table. Uh, don't worry, old man, you're gonna have more fish than you ever dreamed of. You know, that, that is the cliched, age-old promise of hatcheries. Uh, uh, and and it, it, it was it, an empty promise, but the tribes have found a way to use that ha the hatchery as a tool for the means to the end, exercise the right, and rebuild naturally spawning runs. And Gary Soderstrom, what about, what about you? What do you think about um, hatcheries and the future of commercial fishing? Well, with, without the hatchery system, we, we will, won't be in existence very long. We need to be able to, you know, our main uh, way of conserving the fish is time and effort, time it in mesh size and stuff. We get into these little window fisheries where we just go in for just a few minutes and most of the wild fish can pass through. You know, when I first started, we'd fish four or five days a week, you know, five, six months a year. But now we're down to, I think we've fished, I, I, we used to fish, talk about weeks, then we talked about days, and then instead of talking about hours, we've, we've ran it out to minutes, so it sounds better. You know, we fished 600 minutes of spring fish this year, but 360 of that, we could only catch six fish. You know, but it's, that's the, one of the programs we're working on, and, and the people, the public, have to be able to regroup some of this fish that they're paying for. It, it costs a lot. This, you know, the, the taxpayers and the and the ratepayers and everybody's funding a lot of programs, and where their access to those fish. So there has to be some access to it. If people don't get a chance to eat that fish, they're not going to want to raise it. It's you know, if you you told them that they're going to have to spend millions of dollars for something that nobody's ever going to have a chance of the harvesting for for the eat you know the indians know it too you have to eat those fish to respect them to it you know and with, there's there's room for limited harvest and hatcheries are the chance for a harvest until we get those wild fish back you know we've we've sat on the you know like for the summer run we sat there for over 40 years without harvesting any of those before and to wait for them to come back so we could harvest and they've been a success story there has been success stories in this, but the, the hatcheries are a necessary evil. If you're going to keep fish in the Columbia River, keep people interested in those fish, you're going to need hatcheries to support a commercial and sport fishery, or else nobody's, you know, if you can't keep them pretty quick, nobody's going to want to even be interested in them. Um, Jim Martin, I wanted to see what, I wanted to follow up on your comment in the film about how now is the, the perfect time to act on uh, fish recovery, that there's really not, there's just enough of them around for people to, to care and for us to be able to do something. Um, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that and talk about what the future of fish recovery looks like from your perspective. Well, I think the heart of this question, the heart of this film is really getting ready for the future. So much of the conversation is all about the past, about how salmon used to be. Well. Think about how the Columbia used to be. The Columbia in the future will never be like the Columbia in the past, and the salmon in the future won't be like the salmon in the past. But I think what we need to do is we need to rotate around and look out to 2100, and when we look at what this place will look like in 2100, we'll have between three and four times as many people and essentially the climate of San Francisco, Sacramento. And we can go there right now and look at where salmon are and where they aren't. And there are a lot of places where salmon are holding on by a fingernail, but they have no chance. They won't be here in 100 years. But there are a few places where we can use our major rivers as clear migration paths to the, to the flanks of the Cascades and to the flanks of the Rockies where we'll still have cold water. We won't have the same climate, but we'll have a climate where we can have strongholds. 
And what I worry about is we're all wrapped around our axle trying to get salmon to survive the next decade, and very few of us are trying to figure out how to have salmon survive the next century. And those kind of decisions require more strategic investments. Those kind of decisions require taking a few more risks and reversing the burden of proof. So, so people will say, well, you know, I take out the lower four Snake River dams. If you could prove to me that we could save salmon, and if you could prove to me that's the only way we could save salmon, then I'd do it which is essentially saying we will prove it when they finally go extinct because until they go extinct, you can't prove it. So you have to make some decisions with a broader view in mind. And I think now is the time in Judge Redden's court, but in the broader court of public opinion, these are national resources. They're not just us to, up to us locals. Can we make a strategic decision now do we have the courage, or will salmon collapse like every other salmon that has ever encountered essentially our full power of our civilization? Everywhere in the world where our full power of our civilization has encountered wild salmon, they've died. So this is a challenge for our culture and our civilization looking out 100 years. Can we make a fundamentally different kind of a decision and live in harmony with them? We'll make lots of mistakes and have lots of surprises. But it's time for us to look more broadly. It's time for us to take a few more risks and reverse the burden of proof while there's still time. So we do have a few minutes for questions, if, um, if anyone has them. I hate to say we have a. Oh. Can I just res respond really quickly? Because I think it's really important. And so I don't have to write a letter afterwards to, uh, to Charles because I think that this deserves a public response. In the course of, of researching, writing, producing, then editing this film, we did not find uh, a tribal perspective. It was an extraordinarily diverse set of viewpoints, not only within or between sovereign nations, but even within the given nation. People had a lot of different perspectives. A 50-minute program about a story this complex in a watershed this big can't possibly cover everything. As a nature program anchored in salmon life history and looking at this story through the perspective of essentially nature and salmon, what do they need biologically? Obviously, there's a whole lot of cultural decisions we have to make in the application of that. Um, I felt, just speaking for myself, al although this was shared by many of us, that it would be marginalizing the tribal perspective to A, represent it as something homogenous, and B, only be able to do so to a certain extent, and have that be the one element of the film where we kind of uh, superficially explore what the cultural expression of the relationship to this system is like. Uh, I don't think that that would have done you guys any favors to to pretend that there was a tribal perspective. It's a much more complicated uh, situation than that. And if, if unfortunate in many respects, it, it was our awkward way of thinking that that was the best way to respect the situation. Did you want to say anything else? Yeah, just. <laughs> <laughs> just not, not, a, not to turn it into a debate. The, uh, Maybe some of it is this, uh, there was a 60 Minutes program that ran, I think, in 2002 or so, and then was rebroadcast, and that was only 12 minutes or so, and um, they did not include a tribal perspective, but allowed a surrogate to talk about the tribes, and maybe a little bit of, of that is um, part of my sensitivity about it. Um, but I will say, and with all due respect um, to not homogenizing, um, my colleague Jim Heffern in there will know that the tribes, the 15 tribes of the lower, of the U.S. side of the Columbia Basin met with the First Nations in Canada. And, the, and while Grand Coulee is uh, displayed prominently in, in your piece, the dream of fish up there is not dead at all. They are, they are determined to find a way to get salmon restored up there. So I won't speak for First Nations, but I, I will relate uh, today to you that 
uh, they are desperate to find a way to work with the U.S. and to use uh, technologies that are available that might help them do that. Thank you. Um, did anyone have a, a question to ask for the panel? We have a mic over here where you can line up. Oh, okay. Um, My name is Jim Litchfield. Jim Norton. Um, incredible photography. I, I, I really congratulate you on what you did. So the first question is, how did you do that? It, you know, just, just some technical details about how you got down there with the fish and got those photos. They're just incredible. And then the other part is, um, so more substantive, you started with, I think, uh, a promise that starts from Spencer Baird in 1875, 76 of, look, regulating fisheries is just too tough. It's a lot easier to build hatcheries. Let's just do that. And that strategy has played out for 130 years or so. But uh, I'm surprised that you didn't carry that theme a little bit further through the, through the video into the end. Um, we right now are struggling a lot with how do we reform hatcheries and how do we reform harvest to deal with that. And I think we're still struggling with regulating harvest to match what this system can produce. So would you say a little bit more about how you chose to manage those themes through the video? I'll try. The first part of the question with respect to the technical aspect of shooting salmon, what you do is you put the word out to all the wildlife photographers and cinematographers who you know or who might know somebody and say, if you guys have any really good high definition footage of salmon, please send it to us. Uh, one of the people who provided quite a bit of that material is actually here tonight, Andy Mazur. Uh, uh, um, and that proudly is a lot of our best footage from within the Columbia Basin. And the vast majority of our actual shooting budget, our production budget, was on uh, the mitigation system, the, the complex, the dams, the hatcheries, uh, the PBS budgets, even for a nature program, unfortunately, really don't allow for a whole lot of time camped out in the field. Uh, and so that footage is from all over the place. Uh, with respect to the hatchery story, you know, again, I'm going to beg for some, uh, you know, awareness that there are limitations to what we can cover about a story this complex in a 50-minute period for a program that has to be anchored in natural history. The hatchery story is obviously an evolving one, and it, that conversation doesn't begin and end with our film. We had no ambition to, nor do we make any representation, that that story is complete. Neither is the story of the Columbia and its salmon uh, and our intersection with them. This conversation is going to continue. It needs many, many storytellers besides us. I would strongly encourage you know, if there is a tribal perspective or if there are, you know, storytellers, uh, whether they're cinematographers, photographers, writers, uh, from you know, representative interest groups like the tribes, river guides, whoever you are, to be contributing to the narrative of these fish in this river system and our relationship to them. We need all of it. This is a slice of, of this. And I think one of the best parts about this kind of a project in partnership with Oregon Public Broadcasting and all public media is it gives us the opportunity to do exactly what we're doing right now. Now this is, this conversation is not to me reflective of any kind of a limitation in the arc of our story, but very much consistent with it. Um, I consider this conversation an extension of that project. Uh, it didn't end with, you know, at a certain point in Hatchery's history, Already at this table, the conversation about what is the role of hatcheries going forward, to me, is enormously productive. And, uh, you know, I don't know what you consider it, like a web extra or an update, but it's, uh, it's part of this story, and it's great. Thanks. Okay, so I'm sorry to say it's actually all the time we have to do the panel discussion. Oh, sorry. Oh, we do have a couple. Of... Okay, okay, great. Sorry, it's within the same theme, though, that Jim just spoke of. Um, I'd be curious if any of the panel thinks uh, what their opinion is on the role of hatcheries in, with regard to recovery of our wild fish. 
we've heard it talked about as a purpose to an end or um, a necessary evil that we have to deal with, but I'd be curious to hear what the uh, ongoing hatchery program should look like if we were going to actually recover our salmon. Want to try that? I, th I think the status of the science is clear enough to know what hatcheries can do and what hatcheries can't do. There's still debate and argument, but what I believe is hatcheries can uh, supply fisheries, and hatcheries can keep people connected from a business and from an economic and a cultural perspective to salmon. Hatcheries can pull fishing pressure off wild fish so that you take fishing pressure off wild fish. Um, and I think hatcheries can, in some emergency basis, be a temporary reservoir of genetic material when they're just on the edge of extinction. What hatcheries can't do is recover salmon in damaged streams. If, at the end of the day, we will only recreate the diversity, which is really, as Dan pointed out, uh, the true measure of their ability to last much further into the future by restoring our streams. You, you can't save salmon without saving streams, without restoring streams, without living in better harmony with them. We can take dams out, we can recreate migration paths, we can transport fish into the headwaters, and we're going to have to do all those things. We're going to have to reconnect those fish with their headwaters above the big hydro systems, and we're going to have to use engineering to be able to do that. And we can use hatcheries to supply fisheries in the interim. Uh, I personally believe we will never fish hard again on the complex of wild fish in the Columbia. We've just damaged the habitat too much. If you go to Alaska and you see what real functional systems look like, you come down here and we've got a river that's patched up with bubble gum and baleen wire and duct tape. And the best that we can do is preserve a few of the bigger chunks of habitat that are capable of getting cold water and, and manage the rest of our rivers for migration paths to those bigger chunks. To me, that's the vision long term. That vision has very little to do with hatcheries. I think we will only recover these fish for 100 years or more if we recognize that wild fish have to basically do what wild fish do, which is continue to evolve. And the rest of it, we just got to keep off their back. We got to keep the fisheries off their back. We got to keep the hatchery genetic influence off their back. We, we have to basically give them a chance to pursue the remaining good habitat that we have, because a lot of our low elevation streams will simply be too warm and they will simply be too developed. We won't save salmon in these small tributaries. We will only save salmon where we have big chunks of cold water, big chunks of relatively well-protected natural habitat where we're not gonna develop our cities, uh, and that should be the vision for the longer term. What I don't see is a clear articulation of that vision and what I don't see are the strategic, political, and financial investments to basically reach for that broader strategy while there's still time. Okay, did anyone else? <laughs> looks yeah, like I'd, I'd like people to, wanted to respond to that. Some of that same question there. Like, I might, like with Jim, I've read some research that's been done on the, there's programs in the, in the department where they're bringing broodstock, steelhead and stuff, and trying to get wild runs going, but, there's some research that's been done in the Hood River that's kind of showing that that may not be getting the results they want because you're creating a hatchery fish. You're not creating two wild, you know, a wild fish. In the, in the wild, there's one thing that really separates hatchery fish from wild fish. That's genetic diversity. You can take one of this, this male over here and breed him with this female. Well, they may never even uh, associated with each other in the wild. And maybe that female is not viable. She wouldn't spawn or he wouldn't spawn in the wild. They wouldn't be capable of it. But you went ahead and, and created this monster that's, you're gonna send out all these prodigy that's not gonna do, but there's, you know, they've got a bad gene to start with. Wild fish have to be left in a good environment and they have to choose who's gonna breed with who. They gotta do it naturally. And that's the only trouble with a lot of the hatchery intervention we've been trying. We're, we're actually thinking, I think they're doing more damage than the fish are, you know, they're not getting the benefit that we'd like to have out of it. It's just more of a feel-good thing on some of that than the real benefit to the fisheries. Charles? Sure. So I agree with the, the latter part of your argument, Jim, that uh, the, the habitat needs to be restored 
um, that a hatchery alone will not recover fish. Um, any single action alone will likely not recover them. We just but, have a couple minutes, so. I'm sorry? It, we just have a couple minutes. Okay. So, sorry, uh, wrap it up. But we do believe, not just believe, but have proven that hatchery fish can contribute to both rebuilding and restoration, restoration in extirpated streams. I mentioned the Umatilla and Walla Walla, Snake River Falls Chinook. Uh, look at the Coho programs, look at Yakima Spring Chinook, look at, um, uh, well, I'll stop there. But uh, Snake River Sockeye is not, uh, not a tribal program, but it's, it's an example of a hatchery intervention. Uh, so what, what we say is we, we don't stop with hatcheries can't help. We, to use a sports metaphor, would just say scoreboard baby. The fish, in many cases, are coming back and hatcheries are helping. Okay. Thank you all so much for being here and joining the discussion. Um, I do want to continue the conversation and feel free to you know, go onto my blog and leave some comments. Um, there's kind of a discussion site set up and I'll be happy to um, continue it that way. Thank you very much. <laughs>